Namaste. So let's talk about chapters 17 and 18 of the Rudra Sanghita Srishti Kanda, the story of Gunanidhi. Now Gunanidhi was the son of a great Brahmana, very prominent in society. And his mother was extremely indulgent and basically spoiled him and covered up for him and allowed him to get into all those kinds of nasty activities. And because of this, he became like a spoiled brat, going out and hanging out with gamblers and nasty people. And so basically he fell down. He completely lost his Brahminical qualities and he became just a rascal. So eventually, of course, he was discovered because in this world, the way it works, all secrets eventually are revealed. So there's no way we can keep our nasty activities secret for very long. Anyway, so he got kicked out of his house. It says his father, his father said, I will offer him water and rice grains. Well, what does that mean? He considers him dead. So he's offering the Shraddha, which is what a, an offering that you make for dead people. And he put away his wife and he married another woman. So there's so many points here. You see, this is the correct behavior for someone on the spiritual path. They should not accept the uh, misbehavior or disloyalty of wife and sons and, or daughters. I had to divorce both my wives because of unfaithfulness and just general lack of willingness to follow any kind of sadhana or any kind of spiritual advancement. And so this kind of disloyalty is extremely uh, offensive and leads to one's downfall. So here is guna niti. Guna, of course, means material qualities. <laughs> And needy means the storehouse. <laughs> so here he is, the storehouse of material qualities, black. And he's wandering around, doesn't have anything to eat, missing his mother and father, even though he really didn't follow their advice or anything like that. Ungrateful rascal. And so he sees a devotee go into the Shiva temple to make offerings. And he says, oh boy, I'll just wait till they fall asleep and then I can steal all the offerings. Well, this in itself is very sinful. If one is offered the remnants of food offered to Shiva, this is very nice, it's called prasadam. But to steal it, and especially to steal it right off the altar, this is very sinful. So this guy was such a rascal. Huh? But while he was in the altar, actually stealing the food. The lamp was burning very low, and so he tore a piece off his lower garment and added to the lamp as a wick, making it burn brighter so he could see to steal the offerings. <laughs> what a rascal. And then as, as he walked out, he stepped on someone who was sleeping there, which is easy to happen at night. And of course, they got up and sounded the alarm and he was caught by the guards and killed. See, in those days of kings, theft 
was taken very, very seriously. It was a capital crime, and especially theft from a temple. You know, this, this was a really serious crime. So, you know, no police, no courts, no nothing, just kill the rascal. This is, this is justice, actually. This is the way things should be. So the reason we have so much crime today is that we're soft on criminals. We don't punish people. You know, we let them argue in court and try to prove their innocence or justification. And um, of course, that leads to theft being rampant in society, even at the highest levels. So what to, what to do? Anyway, the whole thing is on its, in the process of collapse. So just, you know, grab your popcorn and sit back and enjoy it. So what happens to Gunaniti? The Yamadutas come, as they do for all sinful people. And they tie him up, and they're going to drag him off to Yamada city to be sentenced and punished for all his sinful acts. But wait a minute, the Shiva Dutas also arrive, the Ganas. And they say, no, 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 leave him alone, he's ours. And the Yamadutas are going, well, wait a minute, this guy was completely sinful rascal. He even was trying to steal from the temple when he was killed. You know, what, what virtue does he have? You know, other than his birth, seems like he's wasted his whole opportunity of human life. And so the Shivaganas say, well, he was near the temple and he listened to the chanting with a concentrated mind while fasting on Shivaratri, and he brightened the lamp in the temple and that alleviated the shadow falling on the top of the linga. These were his pious activities, but probably the whole extent of them. <laughs> but they also said something very interesting. They said to the Yamadutas, you guys, you just look at the outside. You just look at the, the person's actions in life. We look at a more subtle level inside, but then they don't really say what that is because they understand the Yamadutas won't get it. So they stop their description. But if we think a little bit, which is highly recommended, uh, we can understand that Gunanidi's inner state at the time was, uh, he was very awake, he was very alert because of being hungry and lost. His heart, which had been closed, was finally opened and he was feeling separation from his parents who he never really appreciated when he was with them. And he was hearing the hymns and watching the ceremony, worshiping Shiva in this heightened state of awareness on this holy day, which has a very beneficial and profound effect. So we can understand due to the immediate nature of Shiva's response, that he was cleansed from his sins. He was actually purified in that moment. And so when he was killed, the uh, Shiva Ganas came and they took him to Shivaloka. <laughs> and he enjoyed there for a long time. And then he was born as the king of Kalinga. Of course, Kalinga means with lingas with Shivalingas, many Shivalingas, many Shiva temples in that place. So he became the son of the king. And in due course, when the king left his body, he became king. And the one pious act that he stressed was lighting lamps in Shiva's temples. 
because after all, that was his experience. Simply due to lighting this lamp in Shiva's temple, because of that, he was saved from hell. So this, you know, is enough to turn anybody's mind around. And this became his thing. This was his trademark. This was his main service. So this is very interesting. Uh, he required all of the chiefs of the different towns and villages to keep their Shiva temples illuminated at all times. And just because of this, we'll see in the next chapter that he becomes, first of all, he, he becomes uh, the ruler of a quarter. In the Vedic system, the eight directions, uh, or ten directions, eight compass points and up and down, they each have a guardian. So he became the guardian of one of the quarters. I'm not sure which one it was. But anyway, this is a very, this is almost like a demigod position. So he becomes advanced more and more in Shiva's service and consciousness. And then we'll see in the next two chapters that Shiva makes him Kubera, the treasurer of the demigods and also Shiva's very close friend. He became a favorite of Shiva, an intimate confidant of Shiva, one of Shiva's most important servants, because Shiva requires wealth. Every king, every ruler, every demigod, every god requires wealth. Like Vishnu has Lakshmi, goddess of wealth. So he has unlimited wealth. His wealth is the material elements, the Mahat. He has all the material elements at his disposal, the combined wealth of the entire universe. So, of course, he can do anything he wants, create planets, create beings, you know, he has so much power. Similarly, Shiva has unlimited wealth at his disposal. You know, so he has unlimited power. So this is the power of devotional service to Shiva. You know, we keep saying, and people don't really get it, if you do a little seva, get a little Shiva Linga, make some offerings, chant some mantras, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, that this will have immediate, very beneficial effects. So if you're suffering, if you have some problems, huh, it doesn't matter how self-realized you are, your material karma is still going to determine your quality of life. Your prarabdha karma, even in the case of an enlightened being, a jivan mukta, they still have to go through their prarabdha karma, the karma that is due for fruition in this life. So if there's any material problem, the way to solve it is to worship Shiva, and it will be immediately beneficial. See, this is, the, this is the key. This is the secret. People don't believe us. But why do you think Shiva Purana fills up so many chapters in the Mahatmya Khanda and in the beginning of the Rudra Khanda? I'm sorry, Sanghita, Rudra Sanghita. Why do you think they spend so much space on describing in detail the worship of Shiva? This is exactly so you can solve your problems. And also, simply hearing about it is itself beneficial activity. You earn pious credits. You get spiritual merit simply by hearing about it and imagining it in your mind. So what to speak of hearing it, doing it is even more powerful. And I'm experienced. I've tried this myself and it works. So if you have a problem, 
If you're, you know, guna needy, <laughs> full of material qualities <laughs> that bring suffering, then you need to worship Shiva and become transcendental to the modes of material nature, just like he is. That's the solution. Aung Tatsa. That means this is the truth. Aung Shaktihi Aung means this is with love, given with love. Aung Namah Shivaya. <laughs> <laughs>